Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review, or at least making a start on a review, of At Home, A Short History of Private Life by Bill Bryson. So, um, this kind of follows on from A Short History of Nearly Everything. In A Short History of Nearly Everything, he covered science. This is much more about domestic life um, and the history of that. As always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads. What does history really consist of? Centuries of people quietly going about their daily business, sleeping, eating, having sex, endeavouring to get comfortable. And where did all these normal activities take place? At home. This was the thought that inspired Bill Bryson to start a journey around the rooms of his own house, an 1851 Norfolk rectory, to consider how the ordinary things in life came to be. And what he discovered are surprising connections to everything from the Crystal Palace to the Eiffel Tower, from scurvy to body snatching, from bedbugs to the Industrial Revolution, and just about everything else that has ever happened, resulting in one of the most entertaining and illuminating books ever written about the history of the way we live. So, let's go in and check it out. Sorry, I'm just sitting here trying to pick the... This has been recovered, and it's got a sticker on it that won't come off. So we have this little introduction here, um, which was interesting. So, Bill Bryson's acclaimed a short history of nearly everything, won the Aventis Prize for science books and the, De and the Descartes Science Communication Prize. Um, and I literally read that just before I read this one. We also have like a chamber plan of his house, which is interesting, kind of helps us to visualize it. Um, and he starts right away in chapter one, the year, by um, talking about the Crystal Palace in London. Um, which was interesting because I'd been watching Crystal Palace Football Club play a football match while I was at my mum's a couple of days before picking this up. And um, yeah, it was just interesting because the palace is no longer there, but you know, it's left, um, left a mark on British society, I suppose. So it was cool to read about when it was created. Oh, I got some of the sticker off. Not much, but some. We get a reference to Thomas Robert Malthus. Uh, he wrote an essay on the principle of population, which suggested that increases in food supply could never keep up with population growth for mathematical reasons. I'm not sure if that's necessarily true, because we do now grow enough food to feed everybody on the planet. It's just that we feed most of it to animals to raise them for meat instead. Uh, we get a, a nod to uh, Max Mallowan, who it says, now best remembered when remembered at all as the second husband of Agatha Christie. I thought this was funny as well, he's talking about furniture. He says, Furniture historians are so starved of fact that they must even trawl through nursery rhymes. It is often written that a kind of medieval footstool was called a tuffet, a presumption based entirely on the venerable line, Little Miss Muffet sat on a tuffet. In fact, the only place the word appears in historic English is in the nursery rhyme itself. If tuffets ever actually existed, they are not otherwise recorded. So, um, it's talking about the importance of bread. Up to 80% of all household expenditure was spent on food, and up to 80% of that went on bread. He says, bread was so important, the laws governing its purity were strict and the punishment severe. A baker who cheated his customers could be fined £10 per loaf sold, or made to do a month's hard labour in prison. For a time, transportation to Australia was seriously considered for malfeasant bakers. This was a matter of real concern for bakers, because every loaf of bread loses weight and baking through evaporation, so it is easy to blunder accidentally. For that reason, bakers sometimes provided a little extra. The famous baker's dozen. So that's where that comes from. Baker's dozen being a phrase, it's usually referred to, used to refer to the number 13. So I thought this was interesting, he's talking about the cooking the Victorians did. The Victorians did a lot of cooking and provided an awesome array of dishes. A popular book of 1851 by a Lady Maria Clutterbuck, who was actually Mrs. Charles Dickens, gives a good impression of the kind of cooking that went on in those days. One suggested menu, for a dinner of six people, comprises carrot soup, turbot with shrimp sauce, lobster patties, stewed kidneys, roast saddle of lamb, boiled turkey, knuckle of ham, mashed and brown potatoes, stewed onions, cabinet pudding, blancmange and cream and macaroni. Such a meal, it has been calculated, could generate 450 pieces of washing up. Wow. Thomas Jefferson gets a mention. He grew 23 different types of peas and more than 250 kinds of fruit and vegetable. Uh, he, he was an early vegetarian and he was a great adventurer with foods. Among his many other accomplishments, he was the first person in America to slice potatoes lengthwise and fry them. So as well as being the author of the Declaration of Independence, he was also the father of the American French fry. And this was crazy as well. It says, uh... By 1851, one third of all the young women in London, those aged from about 15 to 25, were servants. Another one in three was a prostitute. For many, that was about all the choice there was. The total number of servants in London, male and female, was greater than the total populations of all but the six largest English cities. It was very much a female world. Females in service in 1851 outnumbered males by 10 to 1. But he does note they normally left by about the age of 35 to get married and start families. And it talks about 
So the recipients of the servant's attention became spoiled almost beyond imagining. Visiting his daughter in the 1920s in a house too small to keep his servants with him, the 10th Duke of Marlborough emerged from the bathroom in a state of helpless bewilderment because his toothbrush wasn't foaming properly. It turned out that his valet had always put the toothpaste on the brush for him, and the Duke was unaware that toothbrushes didn't recharge automatically. That is, that is privilege, isn't it? And it's talking about when gas became popular, so he writes, Gas had many drawbacks. Those who worked in gas-supplied offices or visited gas-lit theatres often complained of headaches and nausea. To minimise that problem, gas lights were sometimes erected outside factory windows. Indoors it blackened ceilings, discoloured fabrics, corroded metal and left a greasy layer of soot on every horizontal surface. Flowers wilted swiftly in its presence and most plants turned yellow unless isolated in a terrarium. Only the Aspidistra seemed immune to its ill effects, which accounts for its presence in nearly every Victorian parlour photograph. Gas also needed some care and use. Most gas supply companies reduced gas flow throughout their pipes during the day when demand was low. So anyone lighting a gas jet during the day had to open the tap wide to get a decent light. But later in the day as the pressure was stepped up, the light could flare dangerously, scorching ceilings or even starting fires, wherever someone had forgotten to turn down the tap. So gas was dangerous as well as dirty. We learn about the, um, the, the Drummond light or the calcium light, um, which was actually invented by a guy called Goldsworthy Gurney. Uh, Drummond merely popularised the light but never claimed to have invent invented it, but it says Using a flame made from a rich blend of oxygen and alcohol, Gurney could heat a ball of lime no bigger than a child's marble so efficiently that its light could be seen 60 miles away. Uh, we also learned to reduce the danger of uh, fires at night. Uh, they were covered with a kind of dome lid called a couvre-feu, from which comes the term curfew, which is interesting. So it's in French, couvre-feu means fire cover. So Gurney's light ball that we were talking about um, so it says, uh, not only was the light perfect and steady, but it could be focused into a beam and cast onto selected performers, which is where the term in the limelight comes from. The downside was that the intense heat of limelight caused a lot of fires. In one decade in America, more than 400 theatres burned down. Over the 19th century as a whole, nearly 10,000 people were killed in theatre fires in Britain, according to a report published in 1899 by William Paul Gerhard, the leading fire authority of the day. And they mentioned the Great Fire of London, um, and I sent this to my friend and, and it shows you the kind of popular perception. So, as far away as Oxford, the smoke was visible and the fire could be heard as a small, eerie whisper. So I messaged her saying, did you know that the Great Fire of London could be heard from Oxford? And she said, what, the fire or people screams as they died? And I was like, definitely the fire, because only five people are known to have died in it. And um, there's this little reference here. But all city fires pale when compared with the fire that swept through Chicago on a windy night in October 1871, when a Mrs. Patrick O'Leary's cow reputedly kicked over a kerosene lantern in a milking shed under Coven Street, and all kinds of dreadful mayhem swiftly followed. The fire destroyed 18,000 buildings and made 150,000 people homeless. Damages topped $200 million and put 51 insurance companies out of business. Um, but actually, I watched a video, I'll try and remember to link to it below. In fact, I won't, because I, I never end up doing that for reviews for whatever reason. But um, Rob Scallon here on YouTube, he did a video where he wrote three songs using instruments. He wrote and recorded these three songs all in one day using instruments that were selected at random by a little spinny wheel thing. And one of those was called Kate O'Leary, We're Sorry. Um, and it's because it was actually, she's been exonerated since. But it was after this book came out. We get a reference to a, a farmer and agricultural thinker called Jethro Tull, who uh, invented a seed drill. And I was like, oh, presumably that's where the band gets its name from. I have always wondered. People often think as well that Jethro Tull is a person rather than the name of the band. We get a reference to the Duke of Marlborough. Uh, he was so cheap, he refused to dot his eyes when he wrote to save on ink. Um, which is funny because he built Blenheim Palace and it was budgeted to cost $40,000 and eventually cost $300,000. So he might as well have not bothered, he might as well have gone all out with the ink. And uh, it talks about scurvy, it says, On a three year voyage in the 1740s, a British naval expedition under the command of Commodore George Anson lost 1,400 men out of 2,000 who sailed. Four were killed by enemy action. Virtually all the rest died from scurvy. And um, within the animal kingdom, humans and guinea pigs are the only animals that are unable to synthesize vitamin C, and nobody knows why. A reference here was something I learned. The difference between herbs and spices is that herbs come from the leafy part of plants and spices from the wood, seed, fruit, or other non-leafy part. And it talks about the uh, impact that food from the Americas had on Europe. 
Um, it has been estimated that 60% of all the crops grown in the world today originated in the Americas. These foods weren't just incorporated into foreign cuisines, they effectively became the foreign cuisines. Imagine Italian food without tomatoes, Greek food without aubergines, Thai and Indonesian foods without peanut sauce, curries without chilies, hamburgers without french fries or ketchup, African food without cassava. There was scarcely a dinner table in the world in any land to east or west that wasn't drastically improved by the foods of the Americas. And we learn about the introduction of tea and coffee. Weirdly, um, Pepys mentioned in his diary, in his diaries, that he drank tea. Um, and just some random guy, independently, because Pepys' diaries were like, um, kept in code. And some random guy wrote a book about tea and quoted something that Pepys had written in there. And nobody knows how this guy cracked the code and found that one reference to tea in Pepys' diaries. They were available for the public in um, Magdalen College, I think, in Oxford. But nobody knew that they were even, you know, nobody had ever transcribed them or figured out what the code meant. So it's just weird that this happened. And it says, normally, like most of the people of his class and period, Pepys drank coffee, though coffee itself was still pretty novel in 1660. Britons had been vaguely familiar with coffee for decades, but principally as a queer dark beverage encountered abroad. A traveller named George Sandys in 1610 grimly described coffee as being black as soot and tasting not much unlike it. I like coffee, even black coffee, yum yum. I thought this was hilarious as well. John Jacob Astor, one of the richest men in America, but not evidently the most cultivated, astounded his hosts at one dinner party by leaning over and wiping his hands on the dress of the lady sitting next to him. That is rude, isn't it? And we learn about the effect that coal had and pollution, especially in London. Coal was hard on practically everything, on clothes, paintings, plants, furniture, books, buildings and respiratory systems. During weeks of really bad fog, the number of recorded deaths in London could easily increase by a thousand. Even pets and animals at the Smithfield meat market died in disproportionately increased numbers. So this was amazing. <laughs> it still makes me laugh, as you can just tell. Uh, this guy called Addison Misner. It is fair to say that there has almost certainly never been another architect like Addison Misner. He didn't believe in blueprints and was notoriously approximate in his instructions to his workmen, using expressions like about so high and right about here. He was famously forgetful too. Sometimes he installed doors that opened onto blank walls or, in one interesting case, revealed the interior of a chimney. The owner of a smart new boathouse on Lake Worth took possession of his prize, only to discover that it had four blank walls and no way in at all. For a client named George S. Rasmussen, Misner forgot to include a staircase and so put an external one up on an outside wall as an afterthought. This compelled Mr. and Mrs. Rasmussen to put on rainwear or other appropriate attire when they wished to go from floor to floor in their own home. When asked about this oversight, Misner reportedly said it didn't matter because he didn't like Rasmussen anyway. And I just thought this was crazy. We're talk talking about germs here. The most celebrated germ expert in the world is almost certainly Dr. Charles B. Gerber of the University of Arizona, who was so devoted to the field that he gave one of his children the middle name Escherichia after the bacterium Escherichia coli, presumably E. coli. Dr. Gerber established some years ago that household germs are not always most numerous where you would expect them to be. In one famous survey, he measured bacterial content in different rooms in various houses and found that typically the cleanest surface of all in the average house was the toilet seat. That is because it is wiped down with disinfectant more often than any other surface. By contrast, the average desktop has five times more bacteria living on it than the average toilet seat. The dirtiest area of all was the kitchen sink, closely followed by the kitchen counter, and the filthiest object was the kitchen washcloth. Most kitchen cloths are drenched in bacteria, and using them to wipe counters, or plates, or breadboards, or greasy chins, or any other surface, merely transfers microbes from one place to another, affording them new chances to breed and proliferate. The second most efficient way of spreading germs, Gerber found, is to flush a toilet with a lid up. That spews billions of microbes into the air. Many stay in the air, floating like tiny soap bubbles, waiting to be inhaled for up to two hours. Others settle on things like your toothbrush. That is, of course, yet another good reason for putting the lid down. Almost certainly, the most memorable finding of all of recent years with respect to microbes was when an enterprising middle school student in Florida compared the quality of water in the toilets at her local fast food restaurants with the quality of the ice in the soft drink, and found that in 70% of outlets she surveyed, the toilet water was cleaner than the ice. And uh, he talks about how like rich people, when they had things built, uh, especially properties, they often had things torn down. Uh, he talks about the first Earl Harcourt. Um, he was in the process of erasing an ancient village to create a more picturesque space for his new house. Here at least fate exacted an interesting revenge. After completing the work, the Earl went for a stroll around his newly reconfigured grounds, but failed to recall where the old village well had been, fell into it and drowned. And uh, just, this is mad to me, but 
For a time it was highly fashionable to build a hermitage and install in it a living hermit. At Paint Hill in Surrey, one man signed a contract to live seven years in picturesque seclusion, observing a monastic silence for £100 a year, but was fired after just three weeks when he was spotted drinking in the local pub. An estate owner in Lancashire promised £50 a year for life to anyone who would pass seven years in an underground dwelling on his estate without cutting his hair or toenails or talking to another person. Someone took up the offer and actually lasted four years before deciding he could take no more. Whether he was given at least a partial pension for his efforts is sadly unknown. I hope he was. Uh, we get we learn about Capability Brown and, and it says Brown was once offered a thousand pounds to do an estate in Ireland but declined saying that he hadn't done all of England yet. And uh, he notes his achievements were by no means unreservedly admired by all. The poet Richard Owen Cambridge once declared to Brown, I very earnestly wish I may die before you Mr Brown. Why? asked Brown surprised. Because I should like to see heaven before you had improved it, Cambridge answered dryly. Uh, a little fact here, he says, In the western United States, about 60% of all the water that comes out of taps for all purposes is sprinkled on lawns. And then about Thomas Jefferson and about books. Bear in mind, I think I have about 2,000 books. Of all the puzzling lapses in Jefferson's record keeping, the most surprising perhaps is that he didn't keep a record of his books and had no idea how many he actually had. Jefferson loved books and was very lucky to live in a generation when books were becoming commonplace. Until comparatively recently, books had been really quite rare. When Jefferson's father died in 1757, he left a library of 42 books, and that was regarded as pretty impressive. A library of 400 books, the number that John Harvard left at his death, was considered so colossal that they named Harvard College after him. Over the course of his life, Harvard had acquired books at the rate of about 12 a year. Jefferson, over the course of his life, bought books at the rate of about 12 a month, accumulating a thousand every decade on average. He almost gets as many books as I do, but I buy job lots on eBay. All right, so he talks about stairs, um, one of the most hazardous environments anywhere. He says, no one knows exactly how dangerous the stairs are because records are curiously deficient. Most countries keep records of deaths and injuries sustained in falls, but not of what caused the falls in the first place. So in the United States, for instance, it is known that about 12,000 people a year hit the ground and never get up again. But whether that is because they have fallen from a tree, a roof, or off the back porch is unknown. In Britain, fairly scrupulous stair fall figures were kept until 2002, but then the Department for Trade and Industry decided that keeping track of these things was an extravagance it could no longer afford, which seems a fairly misguided economy considering how much fall injuries cost society. The last set of figures indicated that a rather whopping 316,166 Britons were injured seriously enough in stair falls to require medical attention that year, so it's clearly more than a trifling matter. And some stats on that. Everybody trips on stairs at some time or other. It has been calculated that you are likely to miss a step once in every 2,222 occasions you use stairs, suffer a minor accident once in every 63,000 uses, a painful accident once in every 734,000, and need hospital attention once every 3,616,667 uses. So here we move on to the bedroom, and there's some interesting stuff here, as you might expect. Um, so it says, a plump feather bed may have looked divine, but occupants quickly found themselves sinking into a hard, airless fissure between billowy hills. Support was on a lattice of ropes, which could be tightened with a key when they began to sag, hence the expression sleep tight. But in no degree of tension did they offer much comfort. I just love that's, uh, where, that, where that comes from. And it says, um, Children who were required to sleep in trundle beds low to the floor were likely to be especially familiar with the whiskery closeness of rats. Wherever people were, were rats. An American named Eliza Ann Summers reported in 1867 how she and her sister took armloads of shoes to bed each night to throw at the rats that ran across the floor. Blimey. And here we have a penile prickling ring. This is designed to stop uh, erections, basically. There we go. Have a look at that. My favourite thing about this is the bow on it. I think that's wonderful. I wouldn't want to wear one, though. And so typically, men in science have been shitty to women. The painful irony is that women frequently were unwell because considerations of decorum denied them proper medical care. In 1856, when a young housewife in Boston tearfully confessed to her doctor that she sometimes found herself involuntarily thinking of men other than her husband, the doctor ordered a series of stringent emergency measures, which included cold baths and enemas, the removal of all stimulus, including spicy foods and the reading of light fiction, and the thorough scouring of her vagina with borax. Light fiction was commonly held to account for promoting morbid thoughts and a tendency to nervous hysteria. As one author gravely summarised, romance reading by young girls will, 
by this excitement of the bodily organs tend to create their premature development and the child becomes physically a woman months or even years before she should. We get as late as 1878 the British Medical Journal was able to run a spirited and protected correspondence on whether a menstruating woman's touch could spoil a ham. And just an incredible fact here. Not surprisingly, people were sometimes driven by pain and a natural caution regarding doctors to attempt extreme remedies at home. Governor Morris, one of the signatories of the Declaration of Independence, killed himself by forcing a whalebone up his penis to try to clear a urinary blockage. So Augustus Pitt Rivers, who is the guy whose collection eventually founded the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford, um, he wanted to be cremated after he died and it, he also insisted upon it for his wife despite her continued object objections. Damn it woman, you shall burn, he declared to her whenever she raised the matter. Well he sounds pleasant to be married to. And he talks about an illness called ergotism, which comes from a fungal infection of rye grain. A curious aspect of ergotism is that it came with a cough very like a dog's bark, which is thought to be the source of the expression, barking mad. And then he talks about sewage, and there's this great quote here by Samuel Pepys. Most sewage went into cesspits, but these were commonly neglected, and the contents often seeped into neighbouring water supplies. In the worst cases, they overflowed. Samuel Pepys recorded one such occasion in his diary. Going down into my cellar, I put my foot into a great heap of turds, by which I found that Mr. Turner's house of office is full and comes into my cellar, which doth trouble me. And he describes string as being one of the greatest, most underrated inventions in history. Here's why, he says, String is marvellously elemental. It is simply two pieces of fibre placed side by side and twisted together. That achieves two things. It makes a cord that is strong and it allows long cords to be built up from short fibres. Imagine where we would be without it. There would be no cloth and clothing, fishing lines, nets, snares, rope, leashes, tethers, slings, the bows and bows and arrows, and a thousand useful things more. Elizabeth Whalen Barber, a textile historian, was hardly exaggerating when she called it the weapon that allowed the human race to conquer the earth. And he talks about the popularity of, of wigs and then suddenly they went out of fashion. By the early 1800s nobody wanted them and old wigs were commonly used as dust mops despite being super expensive to begin with. And uh, we learn about Dante Gabriel Rossetti's wife, Elizabeth Siddle, uh, devoted swallower of uh, Fowler's solution, which, which was just diluted arsenic. And it almost certainly contributed to her early death in 1862. And in a footnote he writes, Overcome with grief, her husband buried her with a sheaf of poems that he had failed to copy. Seven years later, he thought better of the gesture, had the grave dug up and retrieved the poems, which were published the following year. And he talks about basically like the lack of sexualization in Victorian England. So Victorian rigidities were such that ladies were not even allowed to blow out candles in mixed company as that required them to pucker their lips suggestively. And he mentions that brasier is from a French word meaning upper arm, which makes sense because arm is bras. And in French, bras is souchin gorge, which literally means like, I don't know, throat support. Souchin is support and gorge is throat. So yeah, throat support. And then he ends on a note, kind of looking at global warming, he says, The greatest possible irony would be if in our endless quest to fill our lives with comfort and happiness, we created a world that had neither. But that, of course, would be another book. Although I did see recently, apparently he's um, retired from writing books anyway. And this last section here, all of that, that's all um, notes and bibliography and stuff. So all in all, At Home, A Short History of Private Life by Bill Bryson. Very fascinating book. Again, it's you know, a bit of a chunker, 630 pages of relatively small print. And I read this straight after A Short History of Almost Everything, which was another big old book. But he just has such an approachable style and it's so interesting that it's not really like a discomfort or an inconvenience to read them. I really enjoyed it. So I gave this a strong four out of five. So there we have it, that's what I made of At Home, A Short History of Private Life by Bill Bryson. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.